Welcome back to 8701. So in this section, we talk about colorimetry. And in contrast to the discussion of tracking detectors here, um, what we're trying to do is measure the energy of the particles. And we do this by basically destroying them. The underlying contact is rather straightforward. We have a particle and we put a piece of material in front of it, such that it slams into it. And the energy de deposited by the particle is the energy, the measurement we try to to uh, undertake. So in nuclear and particle physics, that's exactly what we refer to as calorimetries. Um, so the detection of particles by measuring their properties through the total absorption in a block of matter. Um, the common feature or the central feature is that the measurement is destructive. So again, in tracking, tracking detectors, we try to minimally disturb the particle and in calorimeters, we try to destroy them. Um, the exception to this might be a muon, which might at higher energies deposit only a small fraction of its energy in the calorimeter, or a neutrino, which just flies through without having any interaction. Um, but the, the purpose is really to measure energies by destroying the particle. And it's widely used in all kinds of areas of particle and nuclear physics, neutrino experiments, proton decay experiments, cosmic ray detectors, collider experiments, and so on. And in collider experiments specifically, the idea is to build the detector such that it completely surrounds the interaction region such that you don't lose energy from the collision um, just passing through an uninstrumented uh, region. The uh, detection mechanism can vary quite a bit. Um, we use scintillators a lot. We use silicon uh, in some modern detectors. We use uh, with this ionization, we use Cherenkov detection we use sometimes cryogenic, cryogenic um, detectors, which are very sensitive to very small energy depositions, and they can be quite useful. Uh, they are used in um, dark matter experiments or in neutrinoless double beta decay experiments, for example. <clears throat> Again, conceptually, we can differentiate between uh, homogeneous colorimeters and sampling colorimeters. The homogeneous colorimeters um, basically, the entire absorber material is equal or is the same as the detector material. So an example for this is lead glass, which is often used. Um, so what you do then in the calorimeter is you uh, induce electromagnetic and nuclear showers, and then the energy of the incoming particle is converted into photons. And then what you need is a photodetector, which then measures the number of photons being uh, coming out of your of your um, detector material. For this to work, the detector needs to be transparent. Um, alternatively, one can use sampling experiments, sampling detectors, where you have you know, the, the, the heavy material being used in order to induce a shower, and then the detection material in order to count, again, the number of photons. So homogeneous calorimeter have typically very good energy resolution. And the reason for this is that nothing gets lost. Everything is being measured in the absorber, which is the detector. Um, but that leads then to some limitations. For example, that the granularity of the detector is typically limited. And then there's no longitudinal information about the shower development. You basically have one block, for example, a lead block, which is shown here, lead tungsten block, which is shown here, uh, used for the measurement. Right, so you produce photons, and so then the photons need to be measured, and that, that's done with photodetectors. Um, here, the requirements, the range of requirements is quite big. Sometimes you want to be able to measure every single photon, so the quantum efficiency needs to be quite high. In other uh, detectors, you need to be able to put this detector in a radiation hard environment, and so that, that then changes. The main types available are the old fashioned photomultiplier tubes, which actually become quite sophisticated, PMTs, there's gas based photodetectors, there's solid state detectors, which are quite popular, so called SIPM silicon um, photodetectors, or some hybrid modules are of those. So the energy resolution in a calorimeter um, depends on a number of things. As I was saying, one measures the number of particles being produced in a shower. And so that's just a counting experiment. And the uncertainty of that um, scales with the square root of the number of particles produced or measured. And so here we have a, a square root n term. 
uh, so the, rel the relative energy measurement has an error which is with one over square root of the energy. And then there's more contributions. Uh, there's constant terms which come from inhomogeneities. In uh, those are elements where there's just no detector, no equipment in the in the in the direction of the of the particles. Those can be overlap regions or regions where you have two detector modules being glued together. You don't measure there, and that leads to then an, uh, a constant term in the energy resolution. And then when you translate the signal in the, the electromagnetic signals into an, uh, an electronic signal, um, there can be noise induced. And that noise then leads to a typical term which goes with one over the energy. So very classical, you have those three components to the energy, three components to the energy resolution. One is with one over the square root of the energy, one's constant, and one is depending on one over the energy. And so when you design a detector, you want to place it such or design it such that the most important physics you want to do with this detector is optimized towards those components. 